Okay, welcome back everybody uh, to the last session of our symposium. We are uh, very honored to have two extraordinary minds uh, of our field and our time taking us along with them as they focus forward to what's to come. This is Pip Lawrenson. Hello, Pip. Pip Lawrenson is the head of collection care research at Tate in the UK and holds a special chair as a professor of art, collection and care at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. She has established and led Tate's pioneering time-based media conservation section from 1996 until 2010. Jill, Jill Sterrett is an arts and cultural advisor and currently a visiting scholar at the Getty Conservation Institute. She was interim director and deputy director at the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago from 2018 to 2020 and director of collections and art conservators at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art from 1990 to 2018. Jill and Pip, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, so I guess I'm gonna kick it off, first of all, by telling you that I, I come to you today with wavy silver hair and black rimmed glasses. Um, I have a gray jacket on and maybe what some would call a brown necklace. Um, what is not visible here is that I am surrounded by bright yellow stickies that are really just recording for myself the amazing things that have been said by everybody here during this these last two days. And in that spirit, I'd just like to thank, um, thank the university in Bern, thank the Martinez, thank the organizing committee and really everybody uh, for an, a really compelling suite of, uh, of papers. Um, Pip? Hi, everybody. Um, it's really lovely to be here. And um, what a treat to follow that last um, session uh, with so much reference to collaboration and to be here with Jill, who I've been lucky enough to be a long time collaborator with. And of course, great thanks to the Martinez for putting this together and uh, for the advisory group uh, as well for the invite. So I am sitting here. I'm a white woman with brown, increasingly gray hair. Um, I'm wearing a blue dress with a pink scarf and um, I have my sort of call center headset on and behind me is a white backdrop. Um, and I am still working from home in London. And you can tell the difference in the lighting between the fact that I'm in London and it's heading to the evening. And I think Jill is in California. So um, we'd love to follow in the footsteps of a couple of our colleagues here. And um, as Martina mentioned, I've just returned to California after three years in Chicago and I'm in residence at the Getty Conservation Institute. So I'm speaking to you, Dave, from the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva people. And I wish to honor and respect their rich and long history, both in the past and into the present. They are the original caretakers of the Tongavar in the Los Angeles basin and the South Channel Islands. So I knew that Jill was going to do this beautiful land acknowledgement and that really did kind of spark a question for me as to what that meant for me sitting in, in London, in the UK. And I think really just echoing some of the things that we um, heard earlier at the beginning of the day, um, I guess I want to kind of acknowledge that I'm sit within the UK um, and a country with a colonial and imperialist history, obviously deeply entangled with Jill's land acknowledgement, and also a history that's closely bound to museums and preservation of collections, and one that really has resulted in uh, this vast riches of collections built on what is a quite violent history well, a very violent history. So I think just thinking about that extraordinary wealth of material culture concentrated in this part of the world is important somehow 
in this conference that because of our global pandemic is reaching to all continents. Um, and I'm interested to understand more about different perspectives on care, I think, um, for our material culture. And some of those things which have perhaps been missing from the professional fields of conservation, um, but which artists, importantly, and scholars, I think, from other fields have really been drawing our attention to. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, Jill, it's it's uh, it also kind of highlights this thing of being in conversation regularly, but at very different parts of the world, but grappling with these structures and systems um, in our museums and places um, of work. And I, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, a couple of things, and um, you know, I think it, uh, we might disclose to everybody that Pip and I have for decades spoken to each other for an hour every Friday morning. I mean, decades. So um, our conversation style is one that really allows for each of us to think out loud and in thoughts that may not be fully formed. And while we will be aim to be completely coherent here um, for the purposes of the conference, there may be some habits of mind and patterns that, that come up. But I, I, I can't help but like, uh, responding to that question by thinking about what Glenn said yesterday about a land acknowledgement as being one of the things that allows us to, or reminds us about how histories are rewritten all the time. And, and it is a perpetual process, this one of cultural heritage. And therefore, how does care actually kind of have that living quality to it? Um, I, I also can't help but think that um, for me, one of the ways of opening up a conversation the way that we did is to be reminded of that point Glenn raised, but also to disturb the cadence of how we regularly talk to each other, to remind ourselves that there are other ways of being, um, being not only in dialogue, but being with each other. And I think that that's as valuable as any concrete deliverable that would come from the ways that we operate is how we are with each other. Um, Pip, your, your title, I think you have two current titles, um, both of which include the word care in it. And I would be remiss not sort of saying expand on care for us. What has <laughs> that meant to be, um, you know, a central word in the way that your job is described? Well, I think it was, uh, I think it's come up a lot, actually, this idea of care. And, um, and I think it does have resonance. And I think, um, I'm sure we'll come back actually to Colleen Ardoin, I hope I've pronounced that right, uh, beautiful paper about caring for plants, and just that manifestation of something so immediate. Um, and so thinking about caring for plants, caring for artworks. Um, it has been a really important for, I think all of us, as, as I think Ruth said as well, just to go back to these fundamentals about these practices of care. And something that's been really helpful for me um, in the last sort of three years is really going back to Joan Tronto's idea of these elements of care. So, and I think it works so well for our field um, where we think about responsibility, responsiveness, attentiveness. Um, there's one more, I'm trying to think what it is. Hang on, responsibility, responsiveness, attentiveness. Oh my goodness, what's the, oh, oh, competence, yes. <laughs> really, really important. And we've seen such beautiful um, examples of extraordinary competences. But I think what uh, within our fields of, of conservation and also responsiveness to kind of artists and artworks. And I think what Colleen's paper did was also just take that idea of care into something so immediate that everyone will feel a connection to our practices of conservation. And I thought that was really a, 
such a, you know, I was imagining the conservators in the lab taking care of these plants and there was something so basic and em around empathy with that. But I'd, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts actually about Caroline's paper. I think uh, we shared we shared a chat stream about this and the notion of empathy certainly was there. It seems to me that one of the things that we're up against as we reflect on where we've been and where we're going is we're looking at kind of expanding the field of caretakers. I think that 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 notion of care is something that um, that shouldn't be nobody. It, why would we exclude anybody from that? Um, and yet we work in a profession that has inherited traditions of, of you know, sort of wearing our gravitas and expertise um, quite quite um, visibly. And I, I so I'm I was really interested in how caring for plants brought that notion to something so everyday, so that surrounds us. And it was um, a way of imagining that really everybody could be a conservator of some kind. And what, what, would, be, what, would, what would the world be like if that was something that we embraced as a, you know, as a profession? Um, all the while maintaining our competencies. I think always in these conversations that we can run into um, snags and pitfalls when we think that because we call out inclusion, that we're somehow reducing the expertise that we bring to our field. And I don't think that that's an ideal outcome. I think we'd want to keep those things always in balance. So um, I, that, that notion of care was, um, and bringing it to the everyday was, was quite compelling and powerful as a message. Um, Pip, it also reminded me, however, of, um, it reminded me of how we came to know each other. And, you know, it was, you had literally just been named the time-based media conservator at Tate. And you came to SFMOMA for a six-month residency because we were grappling with how to, how to instill, how to build um, programs for these new mediums, both analog and digital technologies that we're, we were seeing artists make, make works from. And we, our, your six month residency was really much more about methods of building um, cohorts of colleagues and allies around these issues. And I remember that our first name for the residency had something to do with consensus building. And I'm not even sure that we would ascribe to that as being what we, you know, what we would do today. <laughs> um, but what I also know is that we had formed Team Media, and many of you have heard about this over time, but Team Media has been one of those places of deep experimentation for a long time. The kind of grappling with issues of uncertainty and also grappling with collaboration and different points of view. Um, and it it took time. So we were up against, you know, efficiencies in the way that we were doing our work. You know, we were battling so many different um, inherited traditions uh, about the way practice uh, conservation was practiced in museums. And I think at the end of the day, it goes back to this notion of care because it took first and foremost the idea of caring for everybody around the table and really realizing that everybody's questions were, were of some import to us all. And it's, a, it's, it's nice to remember that because I believe we've been seeing a space where artists have joined the, the table, where we're now quite comfortable in thinking about how we're including artists in these conversations. And I think the next horizon gets us to the gets us to our publics and gets us to what it means to be opening our practice up to our publics and really listening. Um, and so I, I kick it back to you um, to really think a little bit more about maybe how you see moving outside the museum or, or you know. I just think, um, I mean, that, that's such a lovely kind of trajectory, really, the idea of team media and then I think probably one of the really sort of wonderful moments that came out of reshaping the collectible for me was a moment which uh, 
Elia will remember where we were at Tate Liverpool and we had uh, we were we had set up this experiment around Tony Conrad's 10 years alive on the infinite plane where we had new performers and Elia had been there for days just making sure with uh, all sorts of uh, colleagues from time based media conservation uh, that all the equipment was in place and the instruments and we had the new performers and together as quite a kind of major um, undertaking and put together this dossier of, of video and images and text for those performers. So they performed to some of the people who had um, performed the work originally, some, some as early as, as the 1972, you know. So, and there was just like this amazing moment where all of those people were visible, you know, who had taken care of this work for 30 years, 50 years, you know. 50 years, um, one of our timelines for contemporary art conservation, the 50 years. Um, and it was just, just actually having, realizing this small kind of what I call a duck rabbit, rabbit moment where you just shift your perspective and you realize that we are entering, we've been given this license to care for this work and we are ex entering this incredible dynamic network that has been oscillating around Tony Conrad and his work and taking care of this stuff for such a long time. And it was just a change in perspective for me that really does kind of begin to acknowledge that broader world outside <laughs> the museum, which I think has been pointed to a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And then as you say, you know, so what, what is the next kind of horizon of that, of kind of acknowledging um, our place in this broader world? Um, and I know that you've been uh, doing some thinking um, around uh, a project that you're doing with Porto. And I, I wonder if, if you could say a little bit, maybe there's a connection here. I, I see it, I see it. And um, I wanna call out my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Lucia Matos, um, a, again, a longtime collaborator over 10 years, we've been working with each other and to a vision that she's bringing um, at the University of Porto for an art collection that has always been in the School of the Arts. So it's been in an art school. And we are working right now to explore what it means to envision this collection's um, presence in Portugal. Um, and to envision the ways that meaning and impact for the community is manifest in the programs and the facility that is built. And I, I think what is interesting, and so I'm, one of the projects I'm working on with the Getty is, is to prepare for, for this project in, in Portugal. And, and some of the qualities about placemaking that I want to talk about is that First of all, it takes vision from a place like the University of Porto to be able to think uh, in these ways and to be able to imagine an alternative. They've looked carefully at what their collection is. It's a, it's a, it's a collection of over 200 years of objects that have been made by artists from the city and the region and many of whom attended the school. And so it, they understand its direct connection to place and, and they are looking to, to make that overt in many ways, that there will be an in and a kind of under the roof experience at the new facility, which is unlikely to be called a museum. Um, and then, but it is also the doors to the city and its collaborations with community organizations and, and aspects of city government to really connect the objects that are in, you know, in, in the holdings at the School of Arts with the city itself. And in that, um, I just want to call out, and I know we're running tight on time, Pip, but I and we want to talk talk about one more topic. But but the really interesting piece structurally for me, and I throw it out here as much to receive critique and your feedback on this, mm -hmm. is that Tom Lerner and I, in speaking about this at the Getty, um, have looked at a couple of components about this people in place-based stewardship of collections. And 
we are formulating a local group of constituents that Lucia will, will lead and I'll participate in so that we can, before we do anything, we can really understand what impact looks like in Porto. What is, what is it that would make a difference in, these community, in the community? And my time at the Getty will hopefully be um, sort of doubling down on how we take our inherited practices and think about the ways that we can advocate for adaptation um, to be able to achieve some new ways of operating. Um, and I think the other piece that I wanted to mention is how exciting intergenerationality is to me right now. I'm, um, I'm super excited to, to have this long dialogue with, with Dr. Lawrence in here. And we represent decades of experience, but I, I am, I'm on the edge of my seat listening to some of the younger voices in our field and thinking about um, where their intentions are for the field and, and how can we bring our experience to, to really buoy and bolster um, those directions. So um, I, I really, and for anybody who's interested, I um, would love to, like I said, receive all kinds of um, feedback on what, on what we're aiming to do, so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so interesting. And I think everybody's looking forward to hearing uh, the results of, of that work. And, and I really want to echo that idea of um, adding to the conservation toolkit, which I think we've seen actually in this conference, you know, that we've got different ways of being. And similarly, you know, I've been working with um, uh, conserv younger conservators at Tate and I've you know, particularly thinking about Libby Island's work, who's been thinking in response to art, working with artists about radical hospitality, a whole different kind of toolkit. And Jack McConchie really thinking about love and how love uh, comes into our work in conservation and, and just that idea of what it means to embrace the uncertainty, which I think we've heard with some of the examples um, as well, instead of feeling that we need as conservators to always be able to turn things into what are known as tame problems, but actually operate with a different set of skills in this world of, of much more complex, wicked problems, where I think as somebody just to echo, I can't remember who it was, said earlier, you know, we are doing the best we can uh, with what we know at this point, and that that actually bringing all the creativity of conservation to that um, is exactly the right place to be, I think, with some of our, our the, the challenges that we're working with. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I think we should um, invite I, I, others. I, yes, I, sorry. I, I, I somehow feel as if there would be a, a gap, a, a real omission, if we didn't really just say a word or two about, you know, the wicked problems that you mentioned. I think among the most pressing challenges we face, um, as many have said here, is the way that our field will adapt to the larger concerns of the climate. And in every way, it's um, imperative that we think about uh, how that, how, how we do that. And I, I suspect that we could all say many things about that, but I wonder if that's also um, an ellipsis for us as we invite our our colleagues to join us um, for that's the That's a great day. idea. Come back to the start of our day and, um, and also the extraordinary actions actually uh, that we saw that have happened at UCLA, really translating that incredibly dynamically into action. So I think we're going to ask um, those who would who are in the Zoom room with us, <laughs> um, the speakers from today and maybe some from yesterday to put their cameras on and just join us for getting a kind of conversation going. I don't know if uh, any of you guys are up for it. There we go. Hello. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Now there's probably a way in which I can, yeah, we go. I can go gallery, that's much better. <laughs> so I don't know if, uh, trying to see if, uh, 
who we who we have and who would like to kind of pick up on that idea of uh well anything from what we've been discussing but perhaps take us back to the way in which perhaps we're we're learning from art and artists in our response to climate change or how it's beginning to impact our teaching practice or how or whether it's not whether it's really not echoing enough in our institutions at this point um i don't know who would seneca maybe has how has this really impacted the way that you're teaching and how has it come into the conservation program in the way glenn was talking about perhaps um well um it's not really me who did that but we had to have this wonderful uh, initiative called key culture and it's one of our alumni that was really um um uh, motorizing it so we were early on already started using uh recyclable gloves and um all of that but i i do think um outside of the conservation training program in the university as a whole little steps have been taken um perhaps not enough um it's something that that also demands a larger uh, awareness and perhaps the conservation department is a good place to start that because we're all about sustainability yeah i i am it makes me think also about i don't know if anybody else has um read Sanchita Balachandran's paper about the idea of works not being preserved statically um, but instead being used and then to be compost composted from our museums and Nicole thinking about your beautiful examples of decreation and uh, ways of kind of coming into a whole different cycle of reuse or repurposing um i think these are very kind of different ideas <laughs> aren't they in terms of moving away from from holding our collections in these very static um states i don't know if you want to speak to that nicole sure um as an artist and also as an educator um teaching other artists uh mm -hmm. for sure our one of our key missions at OCAD is uh, around sustainability and how that impacts in the teaching studio for art is the choices that artists are making. And we saw so many really interesting examples over the last couple of days of the, the breadth of ways that things are made. Uh, and I find more and more students are making works with no expectation of, um, of static, uh, you know, uh, collection and it becomes, of course, the issue of documentation and conserving that material, which is a whole uh, piece that needs to be explored. But for myself as an artist, you know, I, I feel uh, I feel attached to both sides of the idea that I want to make things that will persist, and I also want to make things that have the freedom to dissolve. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, are there any other comments on this, or are there other sort of reflections that are coming from our from our distinguished group here on the screen? Um, if not, we can open it up to the Q and A. But certainly want to want to make room for any other thoughts that are that are burning. We see Ruth and Martina. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go uh, first, Ruth, because I think I want to hand it over to you because I was so. I was so moved by your presentation and where you brought in this, or where you were emphasizing this. We are humans, and we're talking, we're we're talking to each other as humans. And I know that I'm saying that as a a mentee of Jill Starrett, who has put this the relationship between hum, humans at or we are people. And I I think she said, and I, I know Jill that you said it that that this business. We're this caring for objects is a, a is, is a caring of people and and the 
And I love that you were talking about team media today and how, how it is about bringing, bringing the, 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 the people together that, that care for these objects and, and creating these relationships amongst these people. So, um, and, and I was so happy was when you, in, in your really beautiful talk that was so careful and, and, uh, and I, I was saying to Martina that how, that is such a beautiful talk. It was so touching and the way you asked the questions, it was so respectful and, and it shows like we're, yes, we are all humans. And, and the, the, um, the article that, that, that Pip, uh, you just mentioned, I was also very touched by that. And it, I think there's a, there's a quote in an article that says, who are we preserving these objects for? Who are the people of the present? And it's about the, experiences that, that we people have here and, and you know this conserving for these uh, future these, these faceless future generations anyway I, I love that that both of you and and also in Ruth talk this element of the human was sort of being brought back and the conservation is not happening in a vacuum we're all humans sort of living on this planet so it's thank you for opening up that that this box that uh, sometimes we put ourselves in. Ruth, uh, over to you. Thank you. I'm on motion. <laughs> um, I lost my line of thoughts, but uh, well, yes, uh, it's been important for me the care in, I said in, in small lowercase, but I would say that the small steps, those are the, um, really um, sustainable. Like we go back to the essence, to the essential. And yesterday when the round table was talking about um, how to advocate for conservation, I was all the time saying, well, we should go back to talk to the emerging artists. We should start for the base if we want to really care about advocating because yes, I'm out of the institution um, landscape. So my, my job is very different. I don't know about institution laws. I don't know about all those problems. So my work is with the base. But I think that working with the base, it's both um, sustainable and at the same time, important for the future. And I totally um, agree with that. Santita presented, like, what, uh, who are we preserving for? Like, for who? I had a, an amazing talk with an indigenous artist, Lori Vondor, that she was asking me, why are you so obsessed with the future? <laughs> because maybe you are forgetting that time is now. And in indigenous people think very different about conservation and time and why. <laughs> and yes, even if it's against the, our traditional way to think about conservation, I think we should ask ourselves some of those questions. Thank you for the nice words. <laughs> Uh, if I can, can continue here to what you said, uh, Ruth, I really agree when you mentioned actually before the, the, um, the necessity to actually engage with the younger artists. And for me, I think when I look back also at the conference, I think it was even like a brighter inspiration to actually look even more in other um, disciplines and hear more uh, voices uh, in, the, in the discussion in, in philosophy, in, in social sciences, actually with the artists or are doing a lot in, in, in their words. And I saw, I saw that um, invitation. And I also remembered um, Glenn um, uh, Wharton yesterday when he was talking about uh, these two um, words, care and curious. Um, so curiosity. And I think it was also um, a big in, um, invitation to, to be curious a lot and I think all the examples of the last two days show also the need of experimenting and like thinking in in creative ways in the end so yeah that would be also a takeaway for me 
Yeah, that's really nice. Jim, I remember you once um, writing that just because artists use ephemeral materials doesn't mean they don't want their works to last. How does it feel sitting here and listening to this conversation um, from where you're sitting? Um, I, I remember that that well. Um, and, and I guess, um, you know, I, I would refer to uh, Nicole already today. She says some of her work she wants to have uh, preserved and others she wants to watch um, uh, how they move through time. Uh, and, and I think that that, you know, uh, conforms with what, what I wrote those many, many years uh, earlier because it was in the context of Saul LeWitt where um, uh, it was, some of his work was reproducible and one would have thought all of it was, but um, uh, others um, uh, were not. They were very specific um, uh, uh, works. Um, so I, I think that we, we do take direction from the artist in the initial um, uh, case of, as to what they would like to have um, uh, happen with their works. But yeah, ephemerality uh, may be forced on us by sustainability. I, I think that that is a really, really radical um, approach to, um, you know, just challenge in, in, in fact. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. And just how it shifted our views around uh, Panzer and, and the way of kind of refabricating, I think has been really fascinating. We've got a question from Emily. Um, on the aspect of sustainability, how can we react to the ever growing amount of digital data, both artworks and documentation that we care for and their environmental impact? I think all of the discussions about NFTs have really made us so aware of the environmental impact of, uh, of our digital lives and, you know, what it means to do a Google search actually, uh, you know, and how I think how many Google searches you can do compared with a boiling a kettle of water, you know, it's, it's always very shocking to see that sort of data. I don't know if somebody um, uh, in our room <laughs> would like, who's uh, like to talk to this and, and has, has got to grips with some of the environmental impact of our digital collecting strategies. I'm looking, is Peter here? Yes, but he hasn't got his camera on. <laughs> it's lurking. <laughs> Let's have a look. There's a new message. Maybe that relates to it. Oh, he can't turn his camera on, but he can speak. Maybe. I can. Okay. You got me? Yep. Got okay. You. Sorry. Yeah. The, somehow I'm locked out of the camera. Um, yeah, this is something I think about all the time um, because it just gets piled and um, one thing that we've been reflecting on here at MoMA is just the need for curation of data, like the tremendous, tremendous need for curation of data um, and really have digital preservation, like I was just talking about this recently, like baked into sort of all aspects of institutional knowledge, but also just sort of digital literacy writ large um, that, you know, we need to really sort of break this into everybody's practice and really educate not only the institution, but sort of everybody that like this isn't this isn't immaterial things. These are very real things that have a real impact um, and to really kind of just um, stress the curation of it and really approach it from, uh, in a lot of ways, like an analog way. Like what I say is like, we just sort of pile up this digital storage, but if it was an analog, like a, a paper repository, you see visually, you know, the, the mess that is in front of you and really impress that upon people. But I'd be interested to hear um, what others think. Mm. Does anybody else want to chime in? Maybe Sabine, um, this must have, or Claudia, this must also be an issue that you're thinking about or anybody oh. else. Oh, oh I think Claudia is putting her headset on. Sorry. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually avoiding the topic a bit because hmm, it has historical personal reasons. I was, or I was, I am an environmental engineer. So I studied that actually uh, 30 years ago. And I'm a bit um, frustrated about the whole environmental situation because as you all know, we know that since 
I don't know, 30 years or more, what's what is happening. And so I'm kind of a bit avoiding the topic because I gave it a bit up. <laughs> so I, but what I want to, maybe I shouldn't speak about that. <laughs> but, um, but I think what we also have to consider is how much data we produce. For instance, if we're writing um, maybe just text, we don't produce much data. But if we are making a disk image of a one terabyte disk, we are pr producing a lot of data. So maybe, and also if we um, have a digital repository where we um, save everything three times and not only twice, maybe we also have to think about that, is twice maybe enough? Or do we have to save everything three times? And how often do we make disk images? And um, documentation videos and yeah I don't I mean it's a very difficult question I must say no, thank and, you. yeah thank there you. is a paper about that about the digital um, about the environmental impact of digital preservation I can check it and, and send the link maybe that sounds great I'm conscious we are out of time but Sabine I don't know if I uh, having invited you and then realized how late it was I don't know if you want to just yeah no sorry um just um just a, a short note uh as you know our position as an institution I mean there's no easy answer to that question I mean and we really try uh, to do the best I mean we do an exhibition this year on ecological change and kind of raising awareness on the other hand we are also doing the digital programming I just think that blockchain technology is kind of a key technology that will change a lot of things and it will able enable a lot of things that the museum can dip into for example to allow more participation in a member space and so on of course we will we are in the process of studying it. And of course, sustainability issues are guiding us. I mean, there is something like a green blockchain. We will definitely not use Ethereum as yeah. they are still doing the, um, the, the, the proof of, uh, of work um, minting process and so on. But I think we also need to look at what is happening culturally in this new uh, in this new digital spaces that's our incentive yeah that's so nice i guess again our relationship to that broader world and how this is going to change our practice and thinking about the the future of that um jill before we hand back to the martinas for <laughs> the wrap up i don't know if you have Anything you would like to say? I I I, uh, I really don't have any um, you know sort of pithy closing thoughts or remarks, but I do want to just express um, incredible hope that I have in spending time with all of you in the last two days and hearing about the work that you're doing. I think we're going to need we're going to need us all. This is this is a very very big. Um, challenge in front of us. And one of the things, I guess I do have something I'll say, Pip, thank you. You must have read my mind. Um, I, I do wonder sometimes if the wicked problem that we're all facing is the climate. And we could say the wicked problem in conservation is collections. We could. And we could focus on that. But if we could allow ourselves to engage with a much broader community of people who are all um, looking at uh, the, the climate change and the urgency um, of global warming. I think there's a way of connecting ourselves very actively around a common goal. And I think that's so, we're, it, we need to do it. I think we need to do it as human beings, not as conservators. Um, and so I, I would really love to, um, to keep that conversation going and to think about the ways that um, adaptations in our field can be made manifest toward that, that goal. Thank you. Shall we on that note, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so lovely to see everybody and to kind of share the kind of community over the last two days. And um, 
I think we hand back to our wonderful hostesses. <laughs> thank you, Pip. Thank you, Jill. Um, this was so wonderful. Thank you for, and thank you for bringing us together. I, I loved your idea of, so, so, so they wanted to show that the community by bringing us all to the screen and it was such a beautiful idea. And thank you for inviting all the voices back uh, together. This was a, an amazing, closing of this event. Um, so on that note, we want to thank all participants, all speakers, all panelists, all moderators uh, for all your contributions, your thoughts, uh, the thoughts you shared in the chat, uh, in discussions, in the Q&A. Thank you very much. And uh, this has been an incredible lift on our end. And even though you've seen two faces with the uh, an identity I think that the two of us have to grapple with now uh, um, as the two Martinas. But uh, I, uh, I want to hand it over to Martina to thank the many, the many people that, that, that helped with this lift. Yeah, there were really many people. And we would like also, of course, to thank our advisory board again for helping us put together the program and walking us through the symposium as wonderful, warm-hearted moderators. Thank you so much, Caroline Bohlmann, Christine Frohner, Zanike Stickter, and Gunnar Heidenreich. Many thanks also to our communication department at the HKB for their final financial support and to the, um, the atelier for the wonderful visual design. We would also like to thank all members of the organizing committee who are working tirelessly behind the scenes. Behind this wall, there's an entire headquarter of people on their computers, spotlighting the amazing speakers that we've had, uh, managing the chat. Uh, thank you very much. Here they are, Dörte Döring uh, and Camilla Oedegaard and our colleague Kerstin Linda in the, com in the communications department. Um, and thanks to the Inca Steering Committee for organizing the speed mentoring session, which took place this morning. And of course, thank you as well to all those who contributed in our institution, outside our institutions with ideas, discussions and, and other kinds of support. And after some uh, deserved vacation days, we will uh, we're trying to like get at um, publishing the videos on the website. Uh, we want to send out the list of participants, who, who, all of you who signed up. Uh, we want to share. We want to share the audience. We want to share who's been uh, behind this like black wall, <laughs> this virtual wall. And even though this is the end of the conference, the end of this day, we look forward to continue and to contribute to the ongoing discourse in the field. And we will all do that together, of course. And we wish everyone a wonderful day and a wonderful night. Yeah. Bye. Take much care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you for everything. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.